Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm Joseph Backholm sitting in for Tony. Reminder that the website is TonyPerkins.com where you can watch this and every episode of Washington Watch. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who led the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH under seven presidents, announced today he will retire by the end of 2022. He departs as something of a science celebrity who led an agency with a $6 billion annual budget. However, his leadership has been criticized, including by some Republican members of Congress who want to investigate his handling of the coronavirus response if the GOP takes Congress, takes control of Congress this fall. Joining me now to discuss his announcement and all the latest COVID-19 news is Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, a professor of medicine at Stanford University. He's one of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, which advocated for an alternative approach to COVID-19 and was roundly criticized by Dr. Fauci himself. Dr. Bhattacharya, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. Well, we booked you before the news of the day, and so it does change the direction of this uh, conversation a bit. There's so much to discuss here. Um, for context, for those who may not know, your relationship with Dr. Fauci and NIH has been uh, somewhat adversarial at times. At one point, former director of the NIH, Francis Collins, emailed Dr. Fauci saying they needed a, quote, devastating takedown of you and the work that you were doing. So that context in mind for our viewers, what's your reaction to the news today from Dr. Fauci that he plans to retire? Well, I, I mean, I should start with some gracious things to say about him. He uh, led the, the agency that did a lot of, uh, funded a, the work of a lot of brilliant scientists. And uh, that, that work has uh, helped millions of patients um, that uh, so that in, in that sense i think uh you know that we, we should acknowledge that he, he led the agency uh successfully in that sense but at the same time his leadership during the pandemic has been an, a, a, a total disaster he uh, has espoused this lockdown focused strategy that closed schools closed businesses closed churches mosques synagogues uh disrupted American life and continues to disrupt American life and did not protect people against COVID. He shielded himself from criticism from other scientists and in fact worked to destroy the uh, reputations of, of scientists who criticized him. He showed a, a tremendous amount of hubris in his uh, in, in his in, in the way he thinks about the world, uh, at one point declaring, uh, effectively declaring himself science itself, saying if you criticize him, you're not simply criticizing a man, you're criticizing science itself. Uh, the, 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 the net actions, the net of his actions during the last two and a half years have been tremendously damaging to the well, health and well-being of Americans and, uh, and in fact, people around the world who followed his, followed his direction on lockdowns and I think will be an enormous part of his legacy. Well, Dr. Bhattacharya, you mentioned his um, his his policy with respect to lockdowns, and recently he's indicated that he doesn't feel any remorse at all about that. And in fact, on July 25th, he seems to think we should have done more in that respect. Let's play clip six. Had we known that then, the insidious nature of spread in the community would have been much more of an alarm, and there would have been much, much more stringent uh, restrictions in the sense of very, very heavy encouraging people to wear masks, physical distancing, or what have you. Dr. Bhattacharya, what's your reaction to the idea that we really should have had much more stringent restrictions? Well, I think the main problem with that idea is that uh, by the time he was recommending lockdowns in March 2020, uh, the disease was already circulating pretty widely around the world. Uh, the more stringent lockdowns, well, the premise would be, well, let's let's if we get uh, locked down early enough and, and hard enough, we can get to zero. Well, that premise is false, and it was known at the time to be false. I personally ran a study in early April of 2020 in Santa Clara County, California, and then another one in LA County, California, where we found that uh, in fact. Uh, 50 times more infections uh, with, with the people. There, there were 50 times more infections than identified cases in early April of 2020. The disease was already circulating. Uh, Dr. Fauci, by saying, oh, if we'd only locked down more stringently, we would have solved the problem, is, is it utterly ignoring the, the science that the disease was already here 
widely circulating and very, very infectious. The lockdowns did nothing to stop them and uh, and would have done nothing to stop them, even had we uh, more dramatically closed schools, destroyed businesses for longer. It would just, just would have created more harm with all, no corresponding benefit whatsoever on infection control. Dr. Bhattacharya, to that point, the initial logic behind the lockdowns, and let's remember these were under the Trump administration, was we had the 15 days to slow the spread, which we know in some places turned into two years to slow the spread. But the logic was that we aren't necessarily prepared for this. We can't have everybody going to the hospital at once. Even if everybody's gonna get it, let's get it slowly so that, that, that our healthcare system has the ability to meet the needs of people as they get infected, as they get the disease so we can treat them and hopefully stop people from dying. As we look back, was there a logic to that argument that turned out to be true? No, there was not. Uh, so the main thing is to remember is that uh, the, um, the, uh, the the United States is an enormously large place. There are some places that were hit very hard when we locked down in those 15 days. New York, for instance. Most of the U.S., much of the U.S. had very little, very few cases. Um, the 15 days, if it's, if you're going to slow the spread and reduce the hospital impact, you would say let's do it in those places that are getting hit hardest. Um, and and in fact, they, but that's not what they did. They said let's have a nationwide nationwide 15 day pause now they might maybe they call it a circuit break or something uh, lockdown um they essentially lied to the american public saying okay we only need 15 days to do it when they knew that that wasn't going to be anywhere near enough in fact an in, in infinite number of days to start to slow the spread would not have been enough um so the, the it was it was a mistaken policy from the beginning sold to the american people as a way to protect hospital systems that was not needed uh, at a broad scale a, a much better policy uh, one that we i think we tried to follow was to uh, was to build excess capacity and extra capacity in places that were getting hit hard at the time um and that would have bought more time in the sense of uh, being able to uh, to not overwhelm hospital systems at the point where it was happening, and then focusing on the vulnerable, the people we knew to be vulnerable, that is the elderly and others who had a high risk of, of dying if they were infected. Um, if that message had gone out, for instance, perhaps Governor Cuomo would not have sent COVID-infected patients to nursing homes, knowing that there were vulnerable people there. Uh, the 15 days to slow the spread place the emphasis on hospital systems, protection of hospital systems. And that's why Governor Cuomo did what he did, because he wanted to protect New York's hospital systems. Instead, what Tony Fauci and others should have been doing is telling people, look, older people are the most vulnerable, do all in your power to protect them. And then maybe instead of sending COVID infected patients back to hospitals, he would have, uh, he would have done uh, adopted, uh, adopted means to protect nursing homes and other places where vulnerable people were. Dr. Bhattacharya, as we look back on this, we realize that this was a, a medical situation, but there was also a lot of psychology involved from a policy level. How do you deal with the entire country? You've got 330 million people who are very different in different situations, certainly different opinions. And one of the challenges was this idea of social trust. And White House COVID czar, Dr. Ashish Jha, he recently addressed this. I want to play kind of his reflections on, on, on how this went psychologically and then get your reaction to this. Let's play clip four. The social science of building trust, of countering misinformation, of not politicizing the most basic of public health measures, um, that part turned out to be much, much harder than I think many of us expected. I had a mental model three years ago, and now you're going to see how naive I was. My mental model was you get the science right, you build great vaccines, you build good treatments, everybody will come and get it, the pandemic will be over, we're gonna be in great shape. Turns out, not so simple. Was he naive in his assumptions about how this should go? Should he have expected different? No, he, he actually, three years ago, Ashish Shah's expectations were the right ones. Um, what happened was during the pandemic is that public health decided that it was going to use its, uh, its, its bully pulpit to manipulate the public. 
uh, public health told uh, Tony Fauci himself, and even she shot told told essentially uh, what they would consider noble lies. Right. So, for instance, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, Tony Fauci said uh, that you should not wear a mask. There's no evidence that masks work at all. Um, and you know, actually, it turns out he that was not was not a lie. The evidence the the evidence on masking before the pandemic, for instance, with the flu, was that it didn't work very well. Um, but then later, he changed his mind and said, well, "Look, uh, I, I was lying to you then because I wanted to reserve masks for the the uh, the hospital workers." Well, once you've admitted that you've lied to the public, of course people are not going to trust you anymore. Um, I mean, in fact, there was there was two lies there. One, the initial one about lying about whether masks work, and then the second lie about about whether that they actually that he thinks that they worked, and he, and he admitted that he that they were doing it to trick people so that they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't hoard masks or something. Um, on uh, on issue after issue, for instance, on COVID recovery, producing natural immunity, uh, the, the the public health authorities lied about the evidence, the, the, the very clear evidence emerging from all around the world that many people who had, uh, basically everyone who had COVID recovery, who would- uh, Dr. Bhattacharya? Got COVID. Oh, yes, please. I, I want to get, a, I want to clarify there because you just said that he believed, he knew that masks did not work and he had said that early on, but then he changed his position what possible motive could there be to say, use masks, even though I know that they aren't going to work? Why would he do that? Well, I think part of it was that, that it, it's related to something you said, which is the, the psychology of it. They, the public health had created a, a mass panic. They created this fear of this deadly disease. The World Health Organization said the, the mortality rate from COVID was 3 4%. If you ask people around now, you, they probably still say that, even though the evidence suggests it's one-tenth that rate or even lower, especially if you're younger. Um, so uh, once you've created that panic, I think part of the, the uh, thinking was, well, we have to give people some kind of, of agency, some kind of like control over their fate. And masks are a visible relatively relatively simple thing to do that would help give people some some control maybe reduce the panic so that they could do something uh, they created the panic and then uh they wanted to to give some kind of you know some some kind of visible symbol to 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 address the panic i think that was primarily the motivation there okay and we still see people, and sometimes in a restaurant in, in Washington, D.C., I'll see a group, particularly of young people, it seems, who are walking in all wearing masks. Now, I want we only got a few minutes left here, but upon reflection, what should we have what should we have done differently? What should we do next time if we face a similar situation? The main thing we should have done differently is recognize who was most at risk. The most at risk were people who were older. The the death rate from COVID infections is much higher for people older, minuscule to zero, uh, almost zero for, for children. So we should have worked very hard to protect the people we knew to be most at risk, the vulnerable, the vulnerable elderly, and maybe some others in the population with, with con chronic conditions make them make them uh, at, at risk. On the other hand, we should never have disrupted the the lives of young people who face so little risk. We should not have made them feel guilty. Yeah. Uh, we should have given, uh, we should have moved heaven and earth to try to protect older people while not disrupting the lives of the younger. Uh, I think the, the investments in vaccines and treatment, those were actually really good ideas and we should have done that, but we should not have taken that and then turned it into a, a weapon to destroy the lives of people who, who, had, who were skeptical about the vaccines or for whom the vaccines were not a particularly great idea. Uh, we created the sense of clean and unclean. We, meaning the pub public health did, saying if you were vaccinated, you were clean, unvaccinated not, and just excluded unvaccinated people from public life. A, a civic life. That was an enormous mistake. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, and, and more broadly, we should have followed what the science was actually saying, as opposed to try to use science as a weapon uh, to, to manipulate the, the behavior of the population, which is and which ended up happening during the pandemic. Yeah, Dr. Bhattacharya, um, as you say that, uh, you know, that we should have protected the elderly who are more vulnerable, not disrupted the lives of the younger people. That's not a new observation. There were people who were, including yourself, I will say, saying that very early on in the pandemic. Why do you think that argument uh, was, was not more persuasive with those who were making the policy decisions for the country? 
I think the people who ran the policy decisions for the country, people like Tony Fauci, were blind to the harms of the lockdown. And they were so enamored with themselves and with the ideas that they had that they thought that any opposition to it was ipso facto uh, a, a, a illegitimate. They, uh, when I actually made that uh, yeah. that that proposal in the Great Barrington Declaration in October 2020, Tony Fauci and, and Francis Collins organized essentially what I would call a propaganda right. campaign to destroy my reputation. Um, right. I think hubris blinded them. Once they saw they, that they, they thought that that the lockdowns would work, they looked at China and thought that it would work. They thought, okay, well, we're just not implementing it hard enough. We're not doing it well enough, even though the evidence was very clear very early on that it wasn't going yeah. to work and they wouldn't change their minds. And very quickly, again, about 30 seconds, what have been the uh, consequences of the policy decisions that we made on, on people's lives? Millions and millions of people around the world are dead who not would otherwise not have been. I, I think uh, the, the lives and livelihoods of, of, of hundreds of millions of children have been harmed uh, in ways that they'll pay the cost for the rest of their lives. Uh, businesses have, are, are, are gone. And nevertheless, we've had a you know, you know uh, an incredible spread of COVID everywhere. I think it was a, a, the single biggest public health disaster of all time. And Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, I want to have you back on just to dig more into that because that's a, I know there's a lot going on there and, and the consequences of this that we fully uh, don't understand yet, but we appreciate your courage throughout all of this and your willingness to come share with us today. Thanks. Thank you.